Ring, ring, it's time for another episode of Crossplay Conversations, the show where we dive deep into the world of video games while keeping it light. I'm your host this week, Luke Lewis, and I'm once again joined by my co-host, the sneaker savant, it's Joseph Huber. Hello, how's it going? I'm glad to be here once again off a great PAX weekend yeah. a couple weeks ago, and uh, now we're back in the between the computer screens. Between the computer screens, it's been weird not seeing you and Jacob and the rest of the crew after we spent so much time together, but I'm glad to be on the podcast chatting it up about games as always. Um, Money Business mono. Boy. Indeed, yeah. It's just, we, we I guess, because the episode before this was the one you missed, so Jacob and I had a yep. duo episode. Now you and I are having a duo episode. I'll have to miss an episode <laughs> so then you guys can do one without right. me just for fun right right um but the business boy jacob mccourt could not be with us this evening for the recording but in his absence i want to point folks please go check out um the vod of his pax panels both of them are available including the video game trivia 3 live dub edition panel that's now available to watch on one giant so i'm just wow. going to keep saying it until it stops being cool and it'll never stop being cool so you'll probably get a plug for that the top of every episode but it's very fun the video's cool i'm a little biased because i edited the video but it's very funny um ton of fun so go support our boy jacob mccourt and some quality content out there on old giantbomb.com yes let's do it heck yeah but with that said let's jump into our icebreaker question for the show today we're going to unpack all of the recent microsoft leaks that happened there's a lot of news so that's going to be the bulk of our show is just discussing everything that happened from the console and controller leaks to the game announcements to the different email threads the nintendo stuff there, there's a ton to unpack i can't wait to get into it with you but before we jump into that let's do our icebreaker question in the realm of news discussion joseph i'm curious what game news stories have left you the most speechless in terms of big news drops and big moments? I know I have a couple in mind, but I'm curious what jumps to the forefront for you. Uh, yeah, there's one specific one that comes to mind, and that is the uh, Bethesda acquisition. I think that is because that was the first kind of moment where it was like, oh, we're in a different, we're in a different level now. We're playing like the game has ratcheted up a level that i was not really ready for and the news kind of just broke out of nowhere it felt like so that one was definitely like i woke up and i was like oh man this is this is getting crazy so i would say zenimax acquisition yeah i feel like that truly ushered into your point a new era of what a news drop could be because that kind of felt surreal of like no way that's impossible they can't do that so then when Bethesda, or I'm sorry, Activision happened later, it was surprising, but less so in a sense that like, it was like, oh, Microsoft is capable of anything, which is ironic that now we're talking about a giant news leak from Microsoft, because it does seem like some of these biggest, big news stories all involve their company, all involve internal documents, all involve stuff that that they may or may not have wanted shared at the time it was revealed. Um, also give an honorable mention to the announcement of The Last of Us Part Two at PSX many years ago. In terms of game announcements, that's one that always stuck out to me because I just never expected it to happen. It felt like such a conclusive story that had a beginning, middle, and end, didn't need a sequel, wouldn't get a sequel, was a weird one-off from Naughty Dog, and now it's this, like, giant cultural phenomenon you can go to the universal studios last of us exhibit and all this stuff and we'll probably get a third game if money talks in the games industry which it does it does <laughs> um any other ones you want to throw out there uh i think that is it because it's kind of hard because you're just so always tapped into gaming news like you and i and a lot of things are almost kind desensitized of... to it to some extent of like, it's like anything could happen on a random Tuesday. What, you know? Right. And we always get little whiffs of things about like, this might be happening. This might be coming up. So it's not, it doesn't really hit as much as it used to when we were like kids watching E3. But uh, yeah, I, I definitely think the Bethesda one was the one that caught me by surprise the most recently. And I guess, this most recent leak was pretty shocking as well. 
Yeah, and that, that's a great segue. Let's get right into talking about these leaks. So for those that aren't familiar with the situation, which I don't know how you missed it, g- good for you being off the internet, but I believe this happened on Monday evening of this past week as of this recording, um, where around 72 pages of legal documents and emails and different internal documents from Microsoft were leaked onto the internet. Originally, folks thought it was something to do with the FTC. The FTC later came out and straight up said, this wasn't us. So it was an internal leak at Microsoft and it broke around like 11.30 p.m. Pacific. It was super late in the evening. And I remember I was about to go to bed. I was wrapping up a big playthrough of Starfield and I was about to go to bed, but then I spent probably an hour reading through these different news stories. Um, Shout out to... Um, Tom Warren and Jay Peters over at The Verge, because I think they were cranking out, burning the midnight oil, so to speak, with a lot of this coverage that we'll be referring to throughout the episode. But I think, Joseph, I'd love to get kind of time and place of like, where were you? What were you doing when you read this news? What was your initial take? What was your initial reaction to all of this? And then we'll kind of break down the discussion into the different segments and pieces of all this, because it's a pretty meaty, meaty leak. Yeah, um, I would say that similar to you, it was like, hey, I'm literally right about to go to bed. I was pretty tired, had a long work day, and I was like, okay, it's time to close out the night. And then I just checked Twitter, just a little midnight check, get ready to get get the last little drop of news before I go to bed. And then it was kind of like, huh, okay, this this thing leaked. Now we know about the next gen refresh. I was like, okay. And I was like, wait, now we know about this, that, and then the other. And it just kind of kept coming. And I went to sleep kind of thinking, like, "Uh uh-oh, I wonder how much is going to be dug through by the time I wake up. And, yeah, when I woke up, it was like, yeah, this is an absolute bombshell. Uh, So I I feel like I didn't have the full, like, presence of mind to process how big this was at the time just because I was – I was about to go to bed, right? So, like, waking up and kind of really processing everything, I was like, dang, it's kind of tragic. Yeah, for real, though. And I mean, like, it was very much in layers of, like, the leak of the console. It was like, oh, it's like the Series S leak a couple years ago. Like, that's unfortunate that that happened. But mid-console generation refreshes are pretty common at this point. So it wasn't, like, earth-shattering news. I was like, keep scrolling. But then the onion started to peel back as I was looking through things of, so the the console leak, which then led to the controller leak, which then led to internal documents of games that are currently in development, including multiple unannounced things that we'll get into, um, internal emails between Phil Spencer and Matt Booty talking about possible Nintendo acquisitions and all this stuff. And just like, it kept coming and coming and coming to a point where it was just like, this is insane. I think we were messaging about it in our our group chat. And I think you said something along the lines of like, nobody should know this much about a company is like internal back and forth. And just like, it's a wild time to be uh, into gaming news. And it's definitely like, there's a lot to discuss here. Yeah. I would say it's very interesting. And I, this is why I love talking about Xbox so much is because sure. for one way or another, like we have, so much information about like their inner workings from the conception of the Xbox to where we are today, whether it's because of documentaries that they themselves produce, whether it's because of leaks, whether it's because of court cases that they're getting dragged into, whether it's like a- Epic versus Apple or this Ac- Activision Blizzard acquisition. It's like we have so much information to dig through and like understand their thought process of of how they operate, which like I would love to get that about PlayStation. I would love to see that from Nintendo, but I'm like, oh, totally. We may never will unless PlayStation makes a big acquisition and kind of gets drugged through the ringer like like Microsoft has been. I don't know if we'll ever see a peek behind the curtain as detailed as this uh, sure. corporation. And to your point about the other big publishers and console manufacturers, this leak in and of itself was very telling about Nintendo and PlayStation in a way in terms of the information we got about sales data of different game franchises and these different conversations about ac- acquisitions and like other players that were probably in the conversation to also acquire or be acquired, depending on like the size of the organizations we're talking about. Um, but why don't we kick things off and start with 
discussing this console refresh and the controller link. So once again, pulling from Tom Warren's story over at The Verge, um, we get an image showing a new diskless Xbox Series X design, some enhanced Bluetooth features, um, USB-C port on the front. Kind of looks like a. I have one of the like older Amazon Echo like cylindrical, like my fiance Claire described it as like a dehumidifier looking object. What, what do you What do you make of this thing? Yeah, so uh, I guess I will like pull it back a little bit to sure. for for sake of making this episode relevant even after this this console maybe eventually gets publicly announced i'll say sure. that when we talk about mid-gen refreshes and what i kind of look at them as is i very rarely participated in a mid-gen refresh unless like circumstances just sent me to that realm and realm was a weird word choice but uh like for example the xbox 360 i think my xbox 360 got red ringed so i ended up getting the xbox 360 slim or or s or whatever or just kind of like something like that yeah, yeah, yeah the, something like that it was kind of yeah, like yeah. it was a really small model and it had a really slim profile it was cool that was great um it didn't have any real performance advantage. I remember they were like, oh, Wi-Fi might be faster, X, Y, and Z. It has maybe HDMI in there. I don't know. But I remember it's like, okay, I got this. It's fine. Uh, same thing with the uh, last generation. I got the PS5 Slim just or PS4 Slim just because I came really late into the console generation. Um, I don't think I would have bought it otherwise. I know the PS4. Uh, for pro is out i never felt the need to pick that up uh so looking at this looking at this uh mid-gen refresh looking at the controller and everything the console itself very interesting very interesting that it doesn't have a disk drive uh very interesting that it's a cylinder i don't know if it's going to come with a stand similar to the ps5 or how they're going to uh, swing that uh i don't really have a lot of thoughts like will i get it no because it doesn't really seem to offer any meaningful upgrade um but I do like the controller. I do like that they're now adding haptics into the controller. Yeah. Um, I don't like the design of it. Like, I don't like that it looks like the, the two tone looks pants. ugly. Yeah. The pants yeah. is not good. <laughs> yeah. Not the biggest fan of that. But uh, my hope is I will say the grips that are a part of the two tone, I believe, are the same or similar grips as the Xbox Series Elite. And the grips are nice. So it will feel good. I just don't love the way it looks. Um, but the thing I like is that this potentially opens up, uh, the potential for a elite series three, because if they're putting haptics in the, you know, base controller, I would imagine they're going to eventually want to put haptics into the next elite series controller. So I'm really excited about that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my, that's kind of my general thought. I'm curious what you think about mid gen refreshes and if you're ever compelled to either get a pro machine or a slim machine, uh, where are you at on that? For sure. I think just to back to your point real quick about keeping this episode relevant while we're discussing this news, I, I think it's probably worth mentioning that take all these leaks with a grain of salt. Like, we don't know what's actually going to happen, what's actually going to be announced. Half of these documents are years old. Some of them are more recent. Like, it's it's fun to speculate, though. And I think as we get into things, it's especially within these game leaks that we'll be d discussing, I find it kind of validating to know that, like, whether or not the projects we predicted are actually happening, conversations were definitely had, meetings were definitely had, prototypes were definitely made. So, like, that that's kind of cool in and of itself. But back to this conversation about mid-gen refreshes, like, I'm in a similar boat. I feel like I've owned a couple throughout the years by coincidence, mostly, of if the timing was right when I needed a new system or if I hadn't gotten that next generation console yet, I would jump in. Um, similar thing of, I remember, I think in high school, I traded in my Xbox 360, which at the time was kind of blasphemous to get a PS3. Cause I really wanted to play uncharted <laughs> and heavy rain and okay. God of war at the time. Um, so I did that, but then several years later I got a, I wanted the 360 back. Like I missed it. And so at that point, also my folks were getting into Netflix and they were using the console to stream stuff. So it was like, well, we should have one for streaming purposes for parent use and then have one that I can use 
so then we got a 360 again and it was that black elite model i think that was a little Mm -hmm. more space age looking supposedly red ringed less i don't remember having any tech issues with that so it probably was a little more stable at least in that regard and then the other one i can think of that i owned is the ps4 pro which that i believe i i bought it specifically because it was the spider-man bundle i i thought it looked cool as hell so that was more of a visual aesthetic thing but it also if i recall because the base PS4 didn't do 4K, if I recall. That was a PS4 Pro slash Xbox One X thing. So I, I think you. at the time, yeah, at the time, that was kind of a compelling argument because I had just graduated college. Claire and I were moving into our own place. We were going to get a new TV looking at 4K things. So it was like, oh, this kind of makes sense. Um, but looking at this series X refresh, yeah, there's, there's really nothing about this. That's like, I got to get it. I'm also a physical media fan. So like the no disc drive for me is like, well, I have the, the console with the disc drive. So why do I need this? I do like that. It's a two terabyte hard drive. That's pretty sweet. Um, other than that, nothing crazy here to your point. I am really excited about the controller. I would buy a haptic feedback Xbox controller on day one because there are definitely games where, like, for example, with Resident Evil 4, I could have bought it on Xbox, but I bought it on PlayStation so that I could have the cool haptic feedback adaptive trigger stuff with the survival horror game. Like, things like that, I think, like, I would just end up playing more Xbox. And if we got an Elite controller with haptic feedback, I think it's game over. Like, that would just be a great controller. So definitely interested in that. Um, but yeah, this, it just kind of makes sense, but I'm interested in your thoughts about, um, there was some statistics that came out about the divide of console ownership, specifically with the series X versus series S, which I think is interesting in this conversation, as far as like the relevance of a disc drive. Um, I believe it was Rebecca Valentine's report at IGN that flagged that, According to some of these leaked documents, 75% of Xbox Series owners are Series S owners rather than Series X. What do you make of that? Uh, At first, it was pretty surprising, but when you really think about it, it's not that surprising. Uh, Like, the people that want to play games, the majority of people that are playing games are rather casual players uh they don't really care about the the latest and greatest the highest visuals the 60 frames per second most gamers don't even know what 60 frames per second means so it it makes sense that when presented with an option to play xbox games to get into game pass x y and z they would go with the cheaper option um and i think that kind of moves into the validation of the digital future and the disc drives and um i think this is where i i feel like i'll have a couple hot takes here but this is i feel like going to be a hot take within the gaming community but physical media is great i have some games behind me i picked up from japan like japan exclusive boxes and stuff that's very cool but like if i'm being honest with you like i haven't put a disc in a console in very long and i hate to tell you gamers this but i am a part of the majority like i am a hundred percent a part of the majority people don't really buy discs anymore um and i don't say that as in we should forget about physical media or like it's not important anymore i do think it's important and i do wish the option i do hope the option sticks around for people that want that um especially for this new xbox refresh i hope they go the route that we're hearing PlayStation is going with adding like an external uh, disc drive or something like that, where you could just plug it in and play games that way. But at the end of the day, man, like they're giving you all that terabyte hard drive space for a reason. They want you to just sure. download your games. Uh, a lot of people just want to download their games. Um, and I don't really see a problem with that. Like, I think that's the preferred way that most people want to play and like i said as long as there's an option as long as there's an option for people who want physical media to still play that in some way or fashion uh, whether it's plugging a peripheral accessory or whatever i think that's fine but i don't i am not a part of the crowd that says we need to keep disk drives on our consoles forever built in i'm I'm not i'm not in that crowd yeah it's a tough thing because i feel like part of it was also 
just like an availability thing that the Series S sold so well, because I think there was a good like year to 18 months right after launch amidst the pandemic where you just couldn't get a Series X, even if you wanted one, unless you got it in that initial wave. But Series S's were pretty readily available. Um, I rem- I bought one for my, my dad for his 60th birthday because it was a nice price point. He doesn't give a shit about 4K60 resolution. And he got to play Game Pass, and I pitched it to him as Netflix for video games, and he was sold. Like, it's a it's a simple entry into a great catalog of games. But yeah, in this conversation about the relevance of the disk drive, I, I love physical media. I love having a disk drive. I also like being able to watch 4K Blu-rays because I'm the type of person that's like, oh, the resolution is better for this movie, so I'm going to watch it here. Um, But I get that not everybody is that way and that's totally fine and relevant. I think I've seen some people very scared about like the future of this generation. And I feel like as long as we have Series X as like the prominent console on the Xbox side, I think we'll still be able to buy physical games for it through this console generation. I think next console generation is where that kind of comes into question of will it be disk driveless? Will we have attachable hardware? Is it worth the manufacturing costs to produce physical games if people aren't buying said detachable hard drive like there's a lot of questions there but i do worry about the preservation of the games because even looking at like the early days of like xbox live arcade on the 360 or the wii u eShop and things like that where once those go down they're down and unless you had a system with that game downloaded on the hard drive you can't play it and i think that's kind of sad and that scares me a little bit going into the digital media era but in terms of ease of use it's great yeah um yeah i think there is like there's always that conversation right um i think of it like you said in the game preservation standpoint i think there should always be a way to preserve games i think just not every game is going to have a physical option that's just not going to be a possible thing and i think we do have to start uh compiling ways to keep digital libraries preserved as well just because that's the way the future is going uh but i mean i I like physical games like i think physical games in their own way is an advertising strategy you go to best buy you go to walmart or whatever you go to the electronic section and the games you see physically on the shelf are kind of the games that you will probably pick up on a whim if you're like more of a casual player um but at the same time i think microsoft looks directly at the metrics and looks directly at how people are interacting with their product and they say okay not a lot of people are are inserting discs buying discs or x y and z so we're probably not going to invest heavily in that and i think that's okay right like i think for example you call me the sneaker savant there's a lot of sneakers out there that have a lot of history but the thing about sneakers is that they're like physical media made out of products that actually age over time so a lot of sneakers after about 10 15 years the sole will actually crumble so you can't actually wear a lot of the older sneakers around that's interesting so it's like this weird thing where like there's the trend of like wear your sneakers because they won't last forever but also a lot of these like really hyped rare sneakers from the past have to be treated so delicately because they could literally fall apart at any moment so like I look at that, I'm like, dang, that's pretty crazy. Like, we could lose any of these rare sneakers, but I'm sure you had no idea this was even a thing. You would never think about this. And I think Nike knows that, where it's like, yeah, we could put maybe better materials in our shoes that make them last a little longer, but most people don't care about keeping their sneakers in a in a sealed vacuum for 20, 30 years. Most sne- people are going to buy sneakers every three to four years, right? So it, it happens with every medium and there's pros and cons and the, and the biggest uh, fans are going to want to preserve that, but there's always going to be a push and pull. Yeah, that's fair. I, I like the comparison to the sneaker game because that is a fair point of like, even on the video game side, you think about like yellow NESs or like, red ring 360s or like there's always going to be obstacles to it and i think of organizations like the video game history foundation that are like actively trying to catalog or the stuff no clip has been doing with like digital press conferences and vhs conversion and all this stuff and it's like that work is definitely super important i think it only becomes more relevant amidst this this conversation um about disc drives and physical media going away and all this stuff i have a question yeah so 
going back to the mid-gen refresh, so all the mm-hmm. rumors point to PlayStation actually creating a PlayStation 5 Pro. Um, do you think that PlayStation is going to kind of jump ahead in the in the marketing or whatever because they have this Pro model and Microsoft is not seeming to make any meaningful improvements to their hardware next year? How do you think that's going to play out? In terms of, like, PlayStation Pro or, like, PlayStation 5 you, Pro specs or, like... Yeah, I mean, like, PlayStation 5 is already kind of the console to get, but do you think that gap is just going to be almost irrecoverable? irrecoverable if the PlayStation 5 Pro is just that much better than the base Series X? It's possible. I think it's one of those things where we chatted a lot about this on our console oligopoly episode. And I just, at this point, PlayStation and Xbox are doing such vastly different things. Like, I know we see in those email threads with Matt Booty and Phil Spencer that they want to win the console generation. They want to acquire what they need to to, like, make their platform the best. But maybe I'm too entrenched to answer this question in a meaningful way. But for me, it'll they'll always each have their own relevance and their own, like, interests. And I think, like, I look at young folks or, like, friends of mine that have kids that ask me for game recommendations and that sort of thing. And I, you kind of have to suss out like what your priorities are. If you're going for like very specific high fidelity, single player experiences that you can't get anywhere else. I'd say PlayStation. If you want a breadth of catalog for your kids to play, that's constantly evolving and you can get in at a pretty cheap price point. That's definitely Xbox. So like, But yeah, to your point, it's hard to say. I do think if PlayStation came out in similar fashion to if you remember that PS4 press conference where it was the the literally later in the day after Xbox was like, our console is $4.99, all digital, all online, fuck yeah. And then PlayStation was like, here's how we share a game, hands game box. It's cheaper, it's better, it's it's awesome. Like, never forget that. So I do see a world where PlayStation could come out in the next few months and announce like, Here's our PlayStation 5 Pro. It's slimmer. It's sleeker. It doesn't have a disk drive. It has a two terabyte hard drive, but it has this attachable disk drive if you want it or something. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And kind of beat them to the punch on that messaging and kind of win that battle. Because to your point, like, I think that would kind of separate them. And I, I do think we are at this place of like, if you want the system to end all console generation systems, this generation, it is the PS5, but mm-hmm. There's definitely reasons to have an Xbox too, but I there's there's a compelling argument for PlayStation happening right now. So, I think it will be be very interesting. So, if we look back at last generation, uh, and let's just take the Xbox versus the Xbox One X, um, the Xbox One came out like pretty underpowered compared to the PlayStation Four, um, and that basically flipped when the Xbox One X came out. When the Xbox One X came out, it mm. was the world's most powerful console or whatever. And not even comparing Xbox to PlayStation, but you would have play Xbox games and like try to run Cyberpunk 2077 on a base Xbox One. It was just not happening. You could have an Xbox One X and kind of get a decent performance and really you wanted the Series X. But like when you look at like the hardware that started that generation, it made games like almost unbearable uh, by the end of that life cycle. I'm curious where we're going to land this time. Like, is the PlayStation 5 Pro uh, going to be the only enjoyable experience when we're talking about like the end of the life cycle and having enough power to actually handle these games that we're, we're getting? Um, I don't know the answer to that question because I feel like even right now, the consoles still feel like they're not being maximized or they still feel like there's some optimization issues there um, where, like, I'm just like, okay, like, we're still, like, having issues with Final Fantasy 16 hitting a stable frame rate on the PS5. Like, Starfield, I do have, like, some hitches here and there. It runs mostly well, but I still have some hitches here and there running Starfield, which for all intents and purposes seems like a pretty old game uh, or like in terms of like the 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 power requirements that this game is is requiring. I might be wrong there. I don't know. Uh, so I'm very curious, like by the time we end this generation, is it going to be like we're begging for a new console or is it going to be like hey, PS5 base, Xbox base, PS5 Pro? It doesn't really matter. It's all the same 
it's all the same relative realm of performance. Yeah. I, I think we'll definitely be at a place where I think no matter what the tech, by the time we reach the end of a console cycle, the devs are, have learned how to push that hardware to its maximum point. Um, I think we're already seeing it to an extent. If you look at games like Baldur's Gate 3 and how the issues it was running into preparing to launch on Xbox and how Series S is still like has some features that are different. Um, I forget exactly what it was. I think it was you split couldn't screen. do co-op. Yeah, split screen. That was it. Um, but things like that only make it only make this conversation more relevant in reference to the fact that 75 percent of Xbox users are playing on a Series S. So it's one of those things that like Xbox has to address that if they want their platform to be relevant in these discussions, because if you can't play a game of the year contender on the Xbox that you're promised, that's supposed to be as equally powerful as comp other competitive systems. Like it's not going to be good. Yeah. It's not going to be good for anybody. Yeah. Um, let's segue into talking about some of these game leaks. So in addition to all this console talk, there were several documents that highlighted some unannounced projects, and I want to get your thoughts on some of these, but pulling from Jay Peters' write-up at The Verge, specifically I want to talk about an Oblivion remaster, Doom Zero Year, which is presumably a sequel to the, the id Software Doom games, a Fallout 3 remaster, a sequel to Ghostwire Tokyo, and my most exciting favorite pick of this selection, Dishonored Three. Dishonored Three. What do you, what do you yeah, make of these? Yeah, buddy. So yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go down the list and I'll keep it mostly short. When we're talking sure. about Oblivion and Fallout remasters, I played both of these games. I believe these were probably two of my first Bethesda games ever. Uh, and both of them were I think incredible for a lot experiences. Of folks too, mine too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And both of these were incredible experiences in their own right. Um, so these being remastered, totally for it. Very excited for a new generation of gamers to get their hands on this. I will personally not be going through and playing these again just because I played the heck out of Fallout 3. I basically did every quest I possibly could. And I put probably 100 or close to 100 hours into that game. And I don't need to sacrifice another 100 hours playing something I already played similar thing for oblivion oblivion isn't as fresh in my mind but there are a lot of games that i need to play and sure playing oblivion over again is not at the top of my list uh doom zero year uh i know people loves doom i know people have been waiting to figure out what it has been up to uh so i'm very excited for those people doom is just not really my genre like i like to jump into it here and there but i feel like the motion the way the fast paceness of the game for whatever reason just kind of gets me a little nauseous um, i don't know why that is it's kind of weird no literally no other game does that for me but uh doom is not my it is bag. very fast like it is different than other first person experiences for sure incredibly fast yes yes so doom i'm excited to see what it looks like i'm excited to sure. test it out on game pass or whatever but that's not my game dishonored 3 come on man dishonored 3 i didn't know i would ever be here i saw the rumors i saw the the report saying oh it didn't sell well people aren't buying it well, guess what? Dishonored fans rise up, all right? Because we did enough, apparently. We did enough to make this game a reality. Now, I hope this 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 list is kind of old, so I hope nothing changed. But mm -hmm. I was saying this on my other show, Player Player Pod, uh, that uh, this is kind of the redemption story that I think can put Arcane in, in good graces. Like, I know Redfall wasn't every, anything everybody wanted. They say, we want to go back to Dishonored. We want these realistic sims or whatever. And basically, you're giving us exactly, exactly what we were asking for in the antithesis to Redfall. So, like, if we get this, and I know it probably won't be the same studio. It probably won't be the rep people who created Redfall. It was probably being worked on in parallel or whatever. If we get this, and it does live up to the old Dishonor games, I mean, the slate's clean, all right? Redfall is forgiven. That's all I need. And after that, that's like the, that's like the grail, the arcane grail. So, I don't even know what comes after that. So... I really hope it's around the corner, a year, two year. I hope we see an announcement next year, maybe. But please, man, please let this be a reality. This document said fiscal year twenty twenty four. So, in theory, yeah, I that's the one that sticks out to me the most. Is like, God, I hope it's real. I'd be so stoked. 
I feel like I've been a stan of the Dishonored games since they originally came out. Um, but they're they're so good. They're so fun. Talk about a game that's like really lives up to the you can play it how you want and approach things in different ways. Like I think it was a really revolutionary series that I think in past years, thanks to Game Pass, thanks to folks being very vocal about it, has kind of emerged from that like cult classic status to a more mainstream known thing. So I think it makes a lot of sense and I'd, I'd love to see that one be real. Um, to your other points, like I would be stoked for a Fallout 3 remaster. We're getting to the point where now they're remastering games from our childhood and not just like super retro games or games from like a year or two ago that don't need a refresh. We're old. We're very old. Yeah, I, we're getting there, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I would probably at least jump in. I would love to see like, because I think it's one of those things where, like, if I went back to Fallout 3 today, it probably doesn't look like I remember it looking. But it would be cool to have a remaster that kind of puts the rose-colored glasses on everything. Um, the Ghostwire Tokyo sequel is a really odd oh, yeah. one to me that we, we didn't touch on yet. But coming off of Hi-Fi Rush this year, being, like, an incredible Game of the Year contender, one of my favorite games of the year for sure... I'm surprised to see that they're delving back into a game that I didn't play it, so I can't speak to it, but it did seem like the consensus, like, it's okay. It's kind of interesting. It's fine. You know, it's not a bad game. It's not a great game. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, commenting on this, I, mm -hmm. I will bet money. I will bet money that Ghostwire 2 does not see the light of day. Uh, After this, 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 this must yeah, be... This, maybe before this, it this, came out, this is the, I think this, the roadmap? This is a 2020 document. It's a 2020 document, and I like when did Ghostwire Tokyo release? Let me see. Ghost. It was last Tokyo. year, wasn't it? I think. It was it? I think it was. Uh, release date 2022. So yeah, this was this was when they were like hey, Ghostwire Tokyo. Man, this is going to cool be a hit. concept. Yeah, people are going to love it, and we already got the second one in the bag. And then they released it, and Xbox was like, maybe we just don't. Maybe we make Hi-Fi Rush two or maybe we yeah, do the evil yeah. within or something like that so I, I if anything on this list is not something that will come to fruition i feel like it's ghostwire tokyo too but we'll see we'll see for sure for sure they also highlight in this write-up the indiana jones game which we have yet to see anything from other than that teaser trailer um project kestrel kestrel and an expansion doesn't specify who that's from project platinum and then a vaguely named licensed ip game Ooh, can't wait for that yeah i mean i don't want to get too excited about any of these things this could be anything yeah who, and who, who the heck knows i mean the indiana yeah. jones game is happening that's in development oh, yeah. like we know about that so that's the only one we can like actually count on but yeah it'll be interesting to see what comes to fruition on on any of these fronts we'll say for the indiana jones game uh I am a new uh, Machine Games fan. After I played the Wolfenstein series, I was kind of blown away at how good that those games actually were. So I'm in, I'm in the, I'm in the. I'll trust whatever you put out camp. Of course, I was in that camp with Arcane too, and they gave me Redfall. So I hope Indiana Jones doesn't disappoint. But the way that people have been talking about it behind the scenes, the way that I think Pete Hines was quoted saying like. This is the game Todd Howard has always wanted to make. Like this stuff Ooh. is getting me very excited. Yeah. So, um, and to see that it was originally scheduled, I think one year after Starfield, I really do hope that means that we can see this game either end of next year or early 2025. And if that is the case, I'll be pretty pretty hyped about that. If I were a betting man, I would say we see this at the Summer Games Fest Xbox time frame next summer and then yep. it probably launches like the following spring or summer mm -hmm. like i think we mm -hmm. get this sometime in the next year or two but yeah i'm hopeful for this one i feel like it's a talented team they've had time to to work on it they've had i think the resources and support from xbox have probably only enhanced their ability to pull something cool off so yeah i think that that could be a really cool one um, let's jump into the next wrinkle of this Xbox leak craziness and talk about Nintendo. So mm. one of the internal email things, which let's just like take a moment and say how weird it is to read emails from like 
between Phil Spencer and Matt Booty that are just like one-on-one -on -one emails as if we're like working in the office with them and we were BCC'd on something. Yeah, very like, weird. Very, very weird. Um, but one of the emails highlighted that Phil Spencer said that acquiring Nintendo would be a career moment and basically breaks down like why it would be a huge benefit for their team to acquire Nintendo, what it could do for the Xbox brand, et cetera, et cetera. This was in 2020, and the subject line is random thought. So <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you make of this? I guess first question for you, J or Joseph, geez, sorry. Jacob. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Joseph. It's okay. Um, does this surprise you? What do, what do you make of this leak? Uh, so I guess for one, it doesn't really surprise me like when we're talking about a trillion dollar company that has almost limitless resources and was looking for ways as we've seen with bethesda and uh activision they they were looking ways for ways to like you know make a big statement and make sure that they were situated for the the long haul so it doesn't really surprise me that they were talking about this the fact that it's nintendo is definitely some sticker shock where you're like wait what our baby our you're talking about our baby our precious child nintendo um, I will say I, I will break this down into two fronts. Uh, one, I think Microsoft ever buying Nintendo would be a terrible thing. Um, and this guy kind of goes back to our oligopoly situation where like, if you take one of the big players off the board, everything changes, uh, for the worse and for, for what I think, I think like pricing, game pricing change, uh, competitiveness change, um, all these things change. So I, I never want to see one of the big three taken off the board, whether that's because they go out of business or whether that's because they're acquired, whatever. So I hate that. And I am glad that this will never happen. And that's my second point. I know a lot of people were upset that how could you say this? Or how, how could this be a thing? Uh, I thought it was very interesting that they were the way they said that they would do it. And if you look closely at the email, there's a guy who basically brings this up. And, and this might be two separate emails. I don't know. But there's a guy who's basically not it's not somebody I recognize. So I think it's somebody outside of the typical Xbox vertical. But they're like, why aren't we like looking at people like Nintendo and stuff? Like, I think they fit better into our overall mission than TikTok does, because this, I think, was right around the, the TikTok. Microsoft will buy TikTok because it's mm. going to get banned or whatever time. I forgot so about this guy that. Was, That's right. This guy was like saying, like, why are we trying to buy TikTok when they don't really integrate with anything we do? Have we ever thought about Nintendo? And I think Phil Spencer was kind of like, that would be the that would be goaded if I could get Nintendo, but I don't think we should do a hostile takeover. And I think the the reasoning internally, I think Phil Spencer is smart enough to know if we hostile took over Nintendo, our would brand would never recover. That would be insane. Like, like gamers would riot. But when you think about like Microsoft executives, that's not a thing that's off the table for the average Microsoft executive because businesses sure. are just like if you take over i don't know random company that makes paper dunder mifflin or whatever nobody's gonna care how you acquire them you just acquire them nintendo sure you're gonna have some problems yeah 100 percent. and to that like the fact is like i i wasn't shocked that phil spencer said this but i was shocked at the idea that it would actually ever happen because like mm -hmm. it, they want to make money they're a company they want to be successful they want to be the biggest company N Nintendo is having a crazy year with their game releases and can't keep switches on shelves and all this throughout the pandemic. And it, it makes sense that the thought crossed their minds, but it, it just doesn't seem plausible to me. And to your point about them keeping their brand image, like I don't see a world where they can acquire Nintendo, but still put the front that they're like community first gamers first play anywhere. Like we, video games are cool you know this mindset that i think phil spencer's done a really solid job of like presenting to the audience but yeah it's just so wild and like from a console manufacturer standpoint it's so weird i think about like jacob's um game boy advance panel where they highlighted all the weird peripherals and things that were available for the game boy advance like i just don't see a world where microsoft would ever like embody the like quirky japanese weird fun energy that nintendo has and yeah, it would just I, be really sad to lose like from just like a whim, point of whimsy whimsy I, I would be sad to lose nintendo just with like the video game magic 
Yeah, I agree. I, I think that Nintendo just does not really fit into, sorry, the Xbox portfolio Period. at all. Um, I think when you look at a, uh, a team like Bethesda, when you look at Activision Blizzard, it kind of starts to fit into the picture of what Xbox and the consoles have always been. So I think it makes a little more sense. I think it's safe to say this will never happen, right? This email was sent yeah. pre-Activision Blizzard uh, trial. And even if something happened where Nintendo slipped up and they were looking for buyers, uh, we've already seen the scrutiny it took just to get Activision Blizzard. Uh, I think it's safe to say that you know, Phil and the team are very well aware that the, the FTC and the uh, CMA, probably a lot of other commissions, would not let this go through. So uh, that's why I don't really feel too worried about getting, you know, up in arms about it because this is like pre Activision Blizzard. So um, now that they have are seemingly going to acquire that that company, I think we're not looking at anything big like this any any time in the future. Yeah, you also have to imagine that Doug Bowser and Nintendo are like, now that they're aware, I mean, I'm sure they're like aware of their stakeholdings and their ownership shares and things like that. But I think now they're definitely going to be like hyper vigilant of like what's going on and quote unquote backroom deals and things. Yeah, I think it's pretty interesting, right? Because I'm sure Nintendo, I'm sure, there's a lot of companies out there that I'm sure pitch offers to Nintendo to get purchased. But if you also look at the email, it's very interesting that Phil says, Hey, like basically the situation is uh, Nintendo's share price just does not move. And it's true. I've looked at this. Like I've looked at investing in Nintendo. And even with the biggest announcements, Tears of the Kingdom is 10 out of 10. The share price is pretty much stagnant. Uh, so hmm. in the email, he says like uh, maybe eventually they'll get a board of directors that are actually interested in having the price go up because that's typically – what happens with these companies like you see Bethesda, for example, and you see Activision Blizzard and they need to they can't have the same stock price. Their shareholders want that price to go up, which is why you see these microtransaction initiatives and all these other different campaigns. And eventually, when you can't uh, infinitely make that price go up, you sell the company, which is why Bethesda got acquired and which is why we're seeing Activision Blizzard get acquired also because of the Bobby Kotick stuff. Uh, but Nintendo does not have that problem for some reason. I don't know if it's a culture thing or or what, but their board of directors are kind of like, yeah, we'll keep the same share price for decades and we don't really care. Interesting. Uh, so that's another like when you read between the lines of that email. Um, that's another interesting thing because he mentions, hey, there's somebody who used to be on the board of directors for Microsoft and now he's going over to Nintendo uh, and he might eventually be on the board of directors and force them to find ways to get the price up, which could be a potential buyout. Um, so, yeah, very interesting stuff there for sure. Heck yeah. Um, let's move on to. So then the morning after, well, I guess actually the afternoon after this all went down, Phil Spencer put out an internal memo to Microsoft employees and then also put out a tweet. So let, let's unpack this a little bit because I think there's some layers. Sure. I'll, I'll read his tweet just to kind of set the stage. So he tweeted, we've seen the conversation around old emails and documents. It's hard to see our team's work shared in this way because so much has changed and there's so much to be excited about right now and in the future. We will share the real plans when we're ready. And then the official memo to the Microsoft team was today, several team today, several documents submitted in the court proceedings related to our proposed acquisition of acquisition blizzard were unintentionally disclosed. I know this is disappointing, even if many of the documents are well over a year old and our plans have evolved. I also know we all take the confidentiality of our plans and our partners information very seriously. This leak is obviously not us living up to that expectation. We will learn from what happened and be better moving forward. We all put incredible amounts of passion and energy into our work, and this is never how we want that hard work to be shared with the community. That said, there's so much more to be excited about, and when we're ready, we'll share the real plans with our players. And then he goes on to basically just set up the other positive things they have coming, the launch of Starfield, the launch of Forza, glass half full outlook on this whole situation. But I think I'm, I'm curious to get your take on kind of what's the, what do you make of Phil's statements? And then what do you think the lasting impacts of these leaks are? Cause I think Phil is very quick to kind of dismiss these leaks, say this was not good. 
but these also might not be relevant, so don't worry about it. Are they real? We'll tell you when it matters. Yeah, um, I do feel bad for the whole Xbox team. I think this sucks. Like whenever all this information gets out there, uh, is always a bummer because I think the ultimate goal for like the people that are like working on these projects on the ground level and on the on the upper level is to surprise and and delight people with like all the cool cool things they have in the in the in the pipeline so like it's kind of lame that we now have like uh a lot of these things already in the in the public eye where we can expect oh like maybe at this announcement we'll get this this or this or maybe at this announcement we'll get this this or this so that's kind of a bummer um i do think a lot of these plans are real uh i think the series refresh is very real they got a whole image of it um so i don't think that's changing anytime soon uh, except ghostwire tokyo 2 that's not coming out yeah, mark my <laughs> words on that uh, but everything else seems pretty legit uh, and you can kind of cross check it with information we've already seen rumored or uh, that's already been public and can tell that sure. most of this is legit. Uh, the one thing that might change, and I don't even know if we'll have time to talk about this, but the next gen console, very, very interesting to me. Uh, very interesting to me. But yeah, other than that, uh, yeah, he has to say that. What else is he going to say? It's a bummer. But I think people will. They're, the nerds like us will have like the Nvidia list leak where we're like, oh, this game came out. This game still hasn't been announced yet. This, this, this. But for the most part, people won't really care. I think after, I mean, the the next we're gonna get Activision Blizzard news to to date ourselves. We're supposed to get the ruling on the Activision Blizzard case next week, and that's gonna wash all this sure. down the drain and start a whole nother conversation. So things will move on. Yeah, I agree. I think it. It'll definitely be the type of thing where now every press conference and major event, this is referred to of like, well, maybe X, Y, or Z is real and we'll see it here, kind of mm -hmm. adding fuel to the fire in that sense. But I think there'll be a big news story in a couple of weeks that then is the talk of the town and taking over the conversation. I do think it'll be interesting just to see how this affects like corporate structure at these different console manufacturers and publishers like... Mm -hmm. This isn't the first time a big leak has happened at Microsoft, and I, I'm curious how their company kind of evolves in terms of security and privacy and how they disseminate information. Because um, I just I can't think of a time where we've seen equivalent leaks from PlayStation or from Nintendo. Not that they've never happened, but not to this extent. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's what happens when you are a part of a trillion dollar company that gaming is only like a small slither of what you do. It's like, you know, it's so big that there aren't as many like ways to lock down the information. I remember like a friend telling me that for the PS5 or the PS4 or something like Jim Ryan took some person to like a vault or something in some hotel to show them what the <laughs> PS5 looked like or something like that. I'm like, no, at, at Microsoft is literally in some room, some, some random intern could probably walk by, see it, everything. Like it's not that detailed. And who knows what Nintendo is doing? Like they're, they're starting to get leaks about the Nintendo switch too, but they usually have that stuff tight. So, uh, Microsoft, I think will forever be leaky. They might be a little better in the future, but, uh, it's just it's rough it's rough out there yeah and then with the nintendo stuff too i think about the element of this where folks were like was this a publicity move by xbox and it's like no no it was obviously <laughs> yeah. not like the, no one's leaking 75 pages of emails no um, but like no. with the nintendo switch pro 2 whatever they end up calling it like that feels like it could be kind of intentional in a way of like kind of planting a seed of some mm. conversation but maybe not i digress um, are there any other elements you, of this you want to touch on? You mentioned the next gen console hardware. Um, yeah, I think that's like the last. I think interesting we touched on the thing. big things, but I think that's like the missing piece. Yeah. Right. So for those that are out of the loop, basically the next gen hardware vision was kind of put on like a slide deck, and it was basically like, hey, we're going to integrate cloud with the console to bring like higher performance that, that no console has ever seen and there was a lot of crazy words on there like ray, ray tracing and machine learning and all that stuff um i am very interested at how that's going to play out one because i wonder if that vision is now pivoted because they've been saying a lot that you know x cloud isn't the beast that they originally thought it was but i think 
you, when you when we say cloud, there's a lot of things that go into that because I think of chat GPT, which is cloud based computing. And you're like, wow, if we had some sort of chat GPT like thing in the console or in the in the makeup of the system that kind of enhanced how you could play games on the flyer like things could be generated or whatever that could be interesting i know hideo kojima is working with some uh cloud resources for his new xbox title that they announced so it'll be very interesting what this actually looks like um in 2028 or whenever we're supposed to get this console I, i think this has the most potential to change but i really hope they maybe learn something with their graphics chip. It seems like for for whatever reason, for the last couple of years, the consoles get outdated very fast compared to PC specs. And like over on PC, I'm hearing about DLSS and like all these things that make even like the weakest graphics cards, the weakest modern graphics cards do really incredible things with games. I would really hope this next generation, we kind of catch up there. Like otherwise what are we doing? You know, what are we doing? That's all I got to say. I'm very interested to see how this kind of compares to what the real announcement will be in, I guess, like three to four years. Yeah, for sure. I still get really skeptical anytime any of the big three talk about streaming technology rather than things running on native hardware. I don't think Mm -hmm. I'll ever lose that until it works as flawlessly as I think they want it to. But yeah, we'll have to just see what what's real and what's not (laughs) yeah i think it's interesting too because like you think um, you immediately think streaming but it's not necessarily streaming it's not always streaming that is utilizing the cloud sure yeah so but it's so vague that you have no clue what they're talking about so that's why i'm like i can't wait to see what this actually uh turns into because right now i'm very skeptical i i'm very confused but maybe they find they hit the nail on the head and find something cool. Uh, but only time will tell. Only time will tell. Um, I think we touched on everything, but that was a really fun discussion. Always awesome. Just getting into the news, getting into the nitty gritty. I think that's why we started this podcast was for moments like this news drop where it's just like, man, I want to just I want to talk about this. I want to unpack it. I want to get to the bottom. Yes. of things. So thank you. for yes. that. Absolutely. Um, do you have anything to plug? Any can't pause things in the works? Any any cool happenings? Uh, it's cool if you, if not, to... I put you on the spot. But people should go there anyway and check things out. Yeah, go to the YouTube channel. I'm always working on some videos. Uh, YouTube.com/slash okay. at can't pause. Also can't pause.com as well, where I do my written stuff. Just go check it out. We got a lot of indie games we're showing off there all the time. So go uh, go give a peek there. Also. Player Player, a uh, video game podcast on all podcasting platforms. If you want a double dose of podcasting this week uh, or every week, go check it out with me and my buddy Arsene there. Heck yeah. Love it. Uh, I would also throw out on my end, got a bunch of, bunch of PAX coverage happening. We had our episode on this podcast feed. Claire and I did an episode of Lukewarm Games unpacking the 30 plus games we played at the show. Um, As of this recording, if you go to my website, lukewarmgames.com, I have an interview up with Alex Draycott, who's the creative director at Ironwood Studios, working on Pacific Drive. So lots of cool stuff to check it out. But you can always go to my socials at Lukewarm Lewis and keep an eye out and what I'm doing, where I'm going, who I'm talking to. It's probably about video games, though. Where is Luke going? We need to figure that out. Where is Luke going? It's the next Where's Waldo, but it's just like yeah. a PAX Where's Waldo. Can you find the crossplay Luke. conversations hoodie? You love to see <laughs> there, it. There you go. There you go. Heck yeah. All right, listeners. So we are setting our status to away until next time. But until then, you can do three things for us. You can follow us on Twitter at Crossplay Convos. You can send this podcast to a friend because that's how people hear about podcasts. And you can give us a review on your podcast platform of choice because it really, really helps. Until next time, go put a disc in your disc drive and enjoy some physical media. Have a good night.